Hey guys, so today we'll be taking a break from looking at Debian slash Ubuntu based distributions and today we'll be looking at Fedora version 20 for the desktop, more specifically the 64-bit version. Now I asked longtime commenter Panic at the Apollo uh, on which distribution I should take a look at next and he gave me a choice between two. It was either Fedora or uh, a distribution which many of you might not have heard of called QNX. And I decided to pick Fedora because at first I wanted to do QNX but it isn't an open source distribution and getting a hold of the license was a little bit tricky for this so I thought I might uh, uh, hop on the Fedora bandwagon here. now. Fedora was the second distribution I ever used and that was about five years ago uh, back when I possibly even more than that actually uh, yeah six sev seven uh, when I started university and um, I had a laptop that was an old um, laptop that belonged to someone I knew who gave it to me and I had to basically fix it up and um, not having too much money, being a student and all, I had to fix it up with a free distribution. And one of the distributions that actually worked out of the box was Fedora. In fact, at this particular time, not even Ubuntu worked directly out of the box on this one. So, uh, this was a particularly old laptop. Just to give you an idea of how old it was, it didn't come with any kind of wireless uh, hardware attached to it. It was, it was, it was that old. Um, so yeah, I decided to. Um, install Fedora on it after trying about five other distributions, all of which failed to recognize the hardware, which was even quite old at that time, and older hardware on Linux does tend to get recognized quite easily. Um, but anyway, uh, maybe it was obscure hardware or whatever. Anyway, I got on with it quite well, actually. Of course, uh, the trouble with Fedora that Ubuntu and other distributions of that ilk tend to try and overcome is that it doesn't come bundled with um, media codecs and uh, and sort of closed source codecs and, and the like. But anyway, we'll have a look as we go. So this is the website, it's fedoraproject.org. I will of course put a link to it down in the description below. Um, the second time I used Fedora was, was a time when I used it quite a lot. It was used on a server, believe it or not, for a small office of about seven computers if I remember correctly, and we set this server up on a complete shoestring. Um, of course, if it was a more serious server for a larger office, we'd have used something like Rad Red Hat, or even if we were on a budget, maybe CentOS, but the person who uh, was my line manager at the time wanted something with a, a bit more bleeding edge software on it and was prepared to put up with the aggro of you know, less stable software. Now, Fedora has always been given the uh, the sort of the, the the stereotype of it being the beta version of Red Hat, and that to a degree is true. Um, a lot of what they uh, want to try out, a lot of what they're thinking of putting in Red Hat, and a lot of what they're thinking of developing for Red Hat, often gets sort of beta tested through Fedora. That's almost like um Almost, almost why it exists in the capacity that it does. But then again, of course, that does mean that it has some corporate backing, which gives it a degree of stability and reliability as well. So anyway, enough of my banter. Let's crack on with the distribution now. So I'm running the 64-bit version, as I mentioned. I've got it right here, and I've just booted into the live CD. So, um, there is a slight graphical glitch, which I will point out as we go. It's most likely due to the virtual machine, though, rather than the actual distribution itself. I'm usually quite forgiving of little graphical bugs like that when trying out distributions, because, um, you know, like I say, these distributions are open source, they're free, they give you the ability to build on and improve it. So I don't like to sort of be too critical of them. Um, because of, because of that factor. If they were charging money for it, then I'd certainly um, be, if there was something wrong with them, no, if there was something wrong with them, if they, I would certainly put my um, uh, my critical side up to full cynicism, as it were. Um, but like I say, I'm more than happy to point out little flaws and things like that. That's generally how I go about with these reviews, but I don't tend to sort of be as uh, be as aggressive or assertive when it comes to criticizing distributions for them for obvious reasons rather than just sort of flag them up and let you know they're there rather than uh, anything else okay so we can try fedora on the live cd or we can install it to hard drive um okay well let's let's try it out on the live cd first i haven't had an install yet to run through um uh, usually when I do a trial run, I just sort of trial run the live CD, then I uh, record and then kind of go in blind. Okay, so you can see this little um, graphical glitch here. 
Um, this is simply what I think it is. It's just the mouse uh, interacting with the uh, you know system in the emulator. Uh, so I wouldn't believe that to be there um, in a final install. And uh, right, so this is the all too familiar GNOME 3 desktop, and I don't really have that much experience with it, truth be told. Um, I, I'm not a fan of it, um, really, for kind of the same reasons that I'm not a fan of Unity. Okay, admittedly, Unity is buggier. Unity has sort of almost been restarted several times, or it certainly had a lot of large development changes, many of which were not completely visible to the end user as well. GNOME 3 is uh, in a more steady direction, and it's got a more regular development history, as it were. Um, and it is less buggy, and it is a bit more user-friendly, and it is I certainly enjoy it more than Unity. But um, I don't like user interfaces um, that involve you having to move your mouse all across the screen to do the most simple of tasks. Case in point, right? I'm here, booted up, right? So I've got the time on top. I like the idea that it's one bar, right? When you've got two task bars, you start eating up just too much um, screen real estate. Um, really, you know, you don't need any more than, than one task bar. Um, and a lot of people auto hide that one task bar, and I can certainly see why. Just to get the you know screen real estate is uh, is pretty nifty. I know a lot of people mention that when they run on high widescreen resolutions, they don't mind the Unity bar on the left hand side. It doesn't eat into the real estate too much. But I don't run particularly high resolutions um, because I a lot of my um, my screens actually don't. Well, they go they go up to 1080, but it's it's straining things a bit um, on the uh, on the monitors that I've got. Anyway, um, so we've got GNOME 3 here. We've got the uh, on button, off button, power button, whatever uh, volume. You know, pretty standard GNOME setup. In fact, one of the things about Fedora that I've noticed over the past few distributions is that it it doesn't do much with the initial interface. Now, there are many, many, many remixes, I think they call them, or spin-offs, um, which is basically just the same old Fedora, but with a different desktop environment. This uh, GNOME is the standard one, and I picked the standard one um, partly because it is the uh, flagship distribution. It's the one that I like to review first, because, of course, it's the one they like to put front and center, put the most work in, and so forth. But also, I um, I haven't done a review of a GNOME desktop, and um, I was thinking about doing uh, Ubuntu GNOME Edition, and I may do Ubuntu GNOME Edition, certainly after this one, to compare the two, actually, to see how they uh, how they measure up. So if you click on the... Fr yeah, you can sort of have a bit of fun with the calendar. Can you open the calendar? It's got its um, Fedora has its own um, mouse icon, which I believe it is quite famous for. Although they have changed it substantially over the years. Um, and like I say, when it comes to loading times, boot up times, and things like that, don't take them too seriously on uh, on on these. Uh, uh, sort of tutorials or whatever, because uh, like I say, I'm running this in a virtual machine, and um, as such, um, it's running everything directly off the hard disk drive. So that means some things are going to be faster, some things, some some things are going to be slower than they would be. Um, okay, so it's an it's an evolution based. Uh, an evolution-based uh, calendar. I just wanted to know whether or not you could say link your Google Calendar in, because to me, Google Calendar, it's the only way to go. Um, it's the easiest and most straightforward way that you can sync a calendar across multiple devices, as well as sharing a calendar with friends. And of course, a lot of people already have Google accounts, maybe from YouTube or something else. So um, a lot of people can, can have easy access to it as well. Just my, I don't know, just my experience. But there is yet to be a serious competitor to a lot of Google products. It concerns me a little because I don't like to see monopolies, but, uh, but Google is certainly taking a lead here. Okay, anyway. So, uh, like I say, one of the things I don't like about these t sort of almost Unity, sort of um, tablet-esque um, user interfaces. When I say tablet-esque, I mean user interfaces that, that look like they're, they're geared more towards tablet or touchscreen users than they are towards traditional mouse PC style users. Um, but I don't like the idea that, okay, you click on activities, which is a strange thing to name the, the main menu. If you want to do um, switch desktops, right, you have to go all the way to activities, all the way back across the other side of the screen, and then select it here. That's just, that's a lot of mouse movement for um, for a, for a minor task, something which would actually be included straight there on the taskbar. LXDE would do that in one click. This requires two and moving your mouse all the way th from the left to the right of the screen. Might sound like a little gripe, but when you're doing it day in, day out, and when you switch desktops quite a lot, yeah, you're kind of supposed to use... Uh, I, I, I kind of get the feeling that they want you to use more, more keyboard 
um, interaction than mouse interaction. But uh, I've got a trackable mouse. So I'm like really happy with my mouse setup, and um, and it allows you know it. it, it I've I've got that sorted right. I I understand that the, tradi the traditional moving about your mouse type thing isn't always you know it's it's a, a to me it's a bit of an outdated way of doing things. I think trackable is definitely the way forward. Um, and the reason why more people don't do it is because more people don't really want to learn how to ride a bike a second time, as it were, if you know what I mean. Um, because you can't you kind of have to learn how to use a mouse again from scratch when you switch over to a trackable. But the uh, the end result is certainly worth it in my personal opinion. But anyway, um, that aside, and and again, yeah, with the trackable, to be honest, this is actually easy because you're actually moving less of your body anyway um, but um, but there and also with the uh, with the menu if I wanted to go to the my settings it's you know activities opposite side of the screen there utilities which could easily end up at the other opposite end of the screen you know it's click it's click it's, you know there's a lot of clicking and going through menus um, and like I say if this was on a tablet it would be fantastic fantastic it'd be a great user interface for a tablet and I, I have a feeling that because Linux has always traditionally struggled with the gaming market um, I think that they're actually kind of edging their bets a little more towards the mobile uh, platforms and I think that's a mistake I think and Android are about as good as it's going to get now I, I think that yeah Linux can compete with Android and, and it can, can potentially become a better operating system that, than Android and I would actually argue that it already is um, I, I think that it's not it's not going to get the market share that it wants I think I think it's better off sticking to to a strong focus on PC, and I'm not the only one that thinks that. Many other distributions are trying to preserve the integrity of the PC builds um, that we've come to know and love as well. Okay, so let's get on with an install. So we can go to activities. And I think that's the one for install to hard di uh, hard drive. Yeah. So like I say, I'm all too familiar with the Ubuntu installs, but what's Fedora going to do to us now? Like I say, last in uh, Fedora install that I have personally done was probably the one way back at uni um is that six or seven so we're on to number 20 now so you know they've certainly brought out a heck of a lot of releases so there are probably going to be a lot of changes i'm sure i must have installed a fedora at some point since then um solely just to try it out and test it out maybe uh, again on a virtual machine or something oh, not too sure it's always been on my to-do list now what have we got here is it Okay, just taking a while to uh, taking a while to get going. So, um, a lot of the Linux heads that I know IRL, uh, who are should we say a little little more senior, a little more uh, older than myself, tend to tend to be um, fans of the old Red Hat. It's certainly um, a family of distributions that have a, a history of being reliable, a history of being secure. Um, and a history of um, running servers effectively. Um, so a lot of people I know use Fedora for their desktop machines simply because they uh, want to inherit those positive characteristics. Um, and you can sort of see why. I mean, if you're familiar with the RPM package management system, which again is a fine uh, package management system, certainly one that rivals DPKG, um, why not? Why not? I mean, these you know the, these people love Red Hat based distributions for the exact same reasons why I love Debian based distributions. Um, Debian is you know is a little more on the community side of things, I would say, and Fedora is a little more on the corporate side. But that changes now. Ubuntu's mixed that up a lot, um, I guess. And you know there still is a lot of community interest in um, in in Red Hat based distributions, not only from Fedora, which is uh, often give, you know it's often given the title of being the most popular community distribution that comes out of uh, Red Hat, the Red Hat family, but also CentOS, which is CentOS is like the the uh, the Debian of this particular family. CentOS is like Red Hat, but for people that don't want the corporate backing. Okay. So Hey guys and welcome back. So what I did was quickly switched off the virtual machine and uh, added some more memory and a couple more processor cores and decided to restart the install process uh, simply because it was looking a little on the sluggish side and it appears to have uh, sped things up and made things a little bit uh, more smoother now. So what have we got here? Uh, this is the partitioning 
part of the install process. So we've got the English UK keyboard, network configuration, it's a wired connection, or oh, that's certainly how the um, virtual machine recognizes it. Um, automatic partitioning selected. So let's have a look here. Uh, select the devices you want to install to. This is the virtual box hard disk. We can, of course, um, add in network disks and all that kind of stuff. But let's just uh, go with the standard procedure, right? No disk selected. We have to click. That doesn't look right. Yeah, that, there we go. Okay, right, installation. You have eight uh, 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 free space, which is enough to install Fedora. Would you like to? I can automatically configure Fedora installation to the disk selected, or you can review modify partitions. Let's continue. And it should, shouldn't it be happy with that? Yes. Okay, so that's a little, uh, a little more unusual a little more a little yeah a little more steps than the ubuntu but nothing that uh, nothing that can't be worked out the old root password so yeah fedora of course uh has a root account and a non-root account so it uses a slightly different way of um a weak password too short crikey this is only for a virtual machine uh. It's a weak password. It fails the dictionary check. Okay. I am... <laughs> Good gravy. Okay, right. Um... You... Re okay, right. Um... You happy with that? Oh, right, okay, so it, it'll it say, I can I can pick it. I can pick a pretty dumb password, but uh, you have to click done. You have to click done again. Okay. So no user will be created. All right, we don't need to do that, but you can. You can select, you can create users, you can create routes. And the idea is that when you're actually doing your day-to-day -day work, you use your user account, but if you wanted to change system settings and install new software, you'd log out of your user account and let, then log in as root. So it'd be two separate accounts, whereas with Ubuntu, you just add in the root password. Um, there is an ongoing debate, which way is better? To me, I personally prefer the convenience of Ubuntu, uh, Ubuntu's method. But that being said, um, it, Ubuntu's method's probably secure enough for desktop PCs. Um, if you're if you're running a server or you're running a machine that people are likely to try and crack into, then maybe you might want to uh, take a more serious stance on security in terms of how your accounts are managed. But um, unless someone's actually going to break into your house and uh, and try and crack your machine there and then, there's a good chance that uh, there's a more than likely chance that, you, you, that uh, it'll cause you more hassle than um, and it will save you. Okay, so I just skipped ahead in time a little bit just to um, avoid you the boredom of ha having to wait for the complete install process to happen. Um, but yeah, now uh, we are just finishing up here. It's configuring the install system and so forth. Um, just finished writing to bootloader, that kind of thing. And then we can get uh, rebooting and into the system itself. Now, um, usually there isn't really much difference between the actual system and the live CD, but I usually like to run through the install process just to give you an idea of how uh, how easy it is to install um, all the different installers, their options, um, and and by and large the installer is a good way to get a feel of the kind of user, the kind of end user that they're expecting to pick up their system. So in order to get the best out of Fedora, I have been told by many, many, many of the uh, community members that you need to make the best of external repositories, the, the unofficial repositories. There's a lot of stuff, a lot of extra software being put into uh, Fedora, but, um, uh, but, but a lot of it is done through uh, the external stuff, uh, th through... Um, through external repositories. Okay, so Fedora is now successfully installed on your system and ready to use. When you are ready, reboot your system to start using it.
Good stuff. Good stuff indeed. Okay, so we reboot our system. We do that from up here, I'd imagine. And the uh, the live CD should be automatically ejected from the virtual machine. So for all intents and purposes, for all intents and purposes, okay, so this actually looks like the live CD again. So what I have to do is uh, just simply go into the uh, virtual machine and manually eject the CD. There we go. And just reboot again. Usually not a big there we go and we can start the rescue part, um, start the rescue process or we can start the operating system as normal which is the default one. So also the splash screen uh, not as fancy as the Ubuntu ones uh, as we often see. This is a, a bit of a, uh, a double-edged sword in a lot of ways um, because Ubuntu and its fancy splash screens have come up against um, a lot of bugs as a result of um, NVIDIA, uh, the open source version of the NVIDIA drivers um, clashing with it, basically. Um, oh no, actually even the NVIDIA drivers themselves, I think. Anyway, if you have a NVIDIA card, you kind of have a problem with the fancy splash screens, or at least you used to. I've not seen that problem happen in about a year or so. So, uh, so they probably have fixed that. So, English United Kingdom, good stuff. Input sources, yep. Full name. Yep. Username, I usually just have Chris as my username. No, yeah, no need to make it more complicated than it has to be. I know. Uh, yeah. Computer. That's right. Start using Fedora. Let's put on our Trilby. I done a funny there. Okay. So um, sometimes when I'm running it through an, a virtual machine, it'll revert to a 640 by 480 resolution, and then you have to install a uh, add-on for the virtual machine to actually get it to work. But you don't have to do that to, on this particular operating system. You also don't have to do it on Mint either. Um, so. Let's crack it open. Let's see what we got. Yeah, identical to the uh, live CD. What I like is that y they've got frequent uh, frequent applications there. So you can, uh, you know, you'll have your, your, most people don't really use more than six to eight applications regularly, um, maybe 12, but that, that's enough to easily fit the icons on the screen. But as you can see, there is a very real resemblance to um, to Android here. Uh, you can install the software. So let's have a look at the software center. So cracked into it pretty quickly. Obviously it's still loading the thumbnails and what have you. We can of course have a look at the installed things. Now, like I say, um, I'm not entirely sure because of the uh, virtual machine and all that. Um, the times here, the uh, loading times, may or may not be representative of the final install of an operating system on a standard computer slash hard drive setup. Um, likely, in most cases, they will probably be slower because I've shortened the allocation. You know, the uh, the allocated resources quite a lot because I've got to record it as well. I usually record these when I've got maybe something else uploading in the background or whatever. So. Um, So don't be too harsh on operating systems that uh, that do take a while to load. But it does look like we are having a bit of a hiccup with Fedora 20. Software is up to date. That's quite nice. Ah, here we go. So it's just taking its time to load. It could very well be down to my silly little rural broadband connection as well. Often it decides to... Uh, I'm recording this on a Friday evening. So, because um, this is how I like to spend my Fridays, you know. Because yeah, I'm wild like that. Um, so yeah, internet connection is often quite slow because because uh, believe it or not, Friday uh, is a very, very, very busy time for uh, internet connections. You can see the traffic slowing down in rural communities because uh, you know people don't have social lives anymore. 
thing of the past. The the nerds have won. Okay, so um, while that's cracking on, so it comes with Shotwell. We've we've seen that um, uh, before. LibreOffice Evolution. Also, I believe that comes with Ubuntu. It used to come with Ubuntu. It may not anymore. Files. I'm going to assume it comes with Nautilus. Could very well be wrong. Var. Um, hmm. I like how uh, how the uh, the taskbar and the buttons are are embedded into the. Uh, you know, they're all sort of they're all embedded into to save uh, screen real estate. So that's not too bad. That's good there. Um, there's empathy, evolution. How uh, how well is Firefox? Uh, okay, so Firefox is looking like it holds a much more traditional. Uh, oh, that doesn't look too too friendly. Ah, there we go. Just a bit of a reload. So it gives you some um, some announcements there. Just on the uh, Fedora project. Uh, looks like you're using it. So it gives you an upgrade to Firefox. Um, yeah, one of the sort of the issues that I kind of have had with uh, GNOME 3 is that um, it does seem to still eat up a fair amount of screen real estate space. You can tell with like Nautilus and some of the other programs that are a bit more native to GNOME 3, that where they try and you know give you as much screen space as possible. But on perhaps non-GNOME native programs, you kind of get this mess, which, you know. Like you're all the way down there. You have you do not have that much space for browsing the, the web, you know, that stuff. You could you could perhaps get rid of the menu bar. Maybe get full screen, who knows? Uh, yeah, let's close them tabs. Okay, so it looks like the software center is just taking a uh, taking its time to load up, which is a little bit of a problem. I would really would have liked to have gone through that today. Uh, this gives you a good list of your installed software, though, and the bundles that it comes with. It's a standard bundle, it, but it's a safe bundle. Um, you know that these kind of pieces of software work well together. Uh, a lot of them uh, overlap in their repositories, dependencies, uh, dependencies rather than repositories. Um, and all that kind of stuff comes with a firewall. Um, you don't always get that. Um, I've never had anywhere near the slightest hint of a virus problem with uh, with any of the um, Linux distributions, which is fantastic. I mean, admittedly, not a lot of people are developing malware and viruses for Linux distributions, but it's still not a stable operating system based on that. I mean, it probably is attacked by the more vehemently aggressive viruses because uh, Linux is used to run on a lot of servers. So yeah, that's a little bit of a problem. That's that's a real shame with uh, with it loading up. Oh, right, here we go. Actually, once we're further in. Okay, cool. So it comes with Battle of Wesnoth. We all know and love that. I really want to actually get into Battle of Wesnoth. It's it looks like some you know a, a group of people have put a real serious amount of time into that game, and uh, and it does deserve uh, some recognition. Maybe a, maybe a let's play might be in order for this one. Open Arena, Mines. Uh, these games are seriously dated now, and uh, and that's not a critique of Fedora, that's Linux games in general, because now that Steam's available for Linux, uh, people are developing for cross-platform games, which I think is great, because it means that their games are accessible to more people. Accessibility and inclusiveness are fundamental to uh, the internet, life, and everything, isn't it, really? Okay, so... Yep, yep, yep. This is all the same old software we've seen a million times before. Um, it, yeah, I like how it's actually divided into, like they've divided their games into subcategories actually, which is something that Ubuntu don't do. Um, actually, admittedly, this software, barring the little hiccup with the, the preview things, um, GNOME, LibreOffice Draw, My Paint, Scribus, Inkscape, Featured, 2D, yeah. Okay, um, actually, to be fair, this software manager is by far the best I've seen, actually, right out of the box. Uh, you've got your install software there. 
which means you can remove. Because a lot of people don't have, like, you know, and I like the fact that, okay, you cannot remove these pieces of software. They're fundamental to the operating system. That's great. Um, but yeah, this is... Uh, this is great. A lot of operating systems, they don't make it easy for you to uninstall programs. This does. To keep a nice, clean, tight operating system, uh, especially if, if disk space is at a premium or if you just don't want a clutter of programs that you don't use, especially considering this menu system isn't the most friendly. Like, if you only want to use eight programs, this uh, GNOME 3 probably isn't too much of a hassle if you've got your eight programs just on the left-hand side here. Um... Disk usage analyzer, all this kind of stuff, yeah. Categories, add-ons. What would go in add-ons? Oh, codecs. Co oh, okay. This is... New. Fonts. Bloody brilliant. This is by far the easiest to navigate. Uh, so featured only cheese and um, pitavi. I know that Pitfi have been doing a lot of work on their video editor, and I must do a must 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 give that a, uh, a go. Editing, SO master players. Where is Caden live? Qt record my desktop. Gtk record my desktop. TV. Others. Div fix, Caden Live, Caden Live. Where are you, Caden Live? It ain't here. Jack Rack. It's got Jack. That's never. I got to say, actually, I've, I've not been the biggest fan of Jack. I know it's the best of what it can do in an open source environment, but I really, I really wish that sound engineering on on Linux was perhaps something that was was pushed forward a little more. But yeah. All right. Well, that, I gotta say that's a bit of a disappointment. But um, in fact, I'm almost certain that's not a deal breaker because if we go to cadenlive.org, we can have a look at um, the options here. Yeah, there's a, a Fedora option right there. Uh, ah, RPM Fusion. Uh, rpmfusion.com. So if you want to run a decent um, Fedora machine, you're going to need RPM Fusion. Uh, RPM Fusion provides software that the Fedora Red Hat, uh, Fedora project or Red Hat don't want to ship. Uh, it's provided with pre-compiled RPMs for all current blah, 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 blah. So yeah, if you do want to run a Fedora desktop machine, get your uh, butt down to rpmfusion.org. You'll want that. Um, so... Having trialed this uh, OS now for a, for a fair while, Virtual Machine Manager, Gparted, Emulators, VirtualBox Remote Client, DOSBox, can't go wrong with DOSBox, File Managers. Uh, so in this particular, I'm sure, I think it probably also comes with a Synaptic Package Manager. It'll come with the RPM uh, yum. That's it, if I remember correctly. Settings. So we cracked open settings, maybe there might be a lot of monitor tools. Um, yeah, how they've divided down all these pieces of software has, has I is fantastic. It's great. It doesn't overclutter you as well. Um, a lot of the time, the uh, software uh, install centers that you know come with the distributions they often include like all of the programs and when I say all of the programs programs that that haven't been uh, upgraded or maintained in six years or any you know things like that and and that's that is that is something that we need to look at um, as well is, is letting go of old software that's no longer maintained and doing so in a slightly more um, assertive manner because there's a lot of choice on so you know for the software that you can use in uh, Linux distributions, and it's important to make sure that at least you know to to not clutter those choices. Not basically, a lot of times in Linux, you you run the risk of get having too much choice. 
um, and having to sift through a lot of crap to find some real gold gems in there. And it would be nice if perhaps some of the distributions, rather than just bundling all their software into their software centers, that they actually were a little more discerning, a little more um, curative. Is that the word I'm looking for? Um, they, they acted slightly more as curators to the software in their libraries. Uh, would would be nice. Steam's got a lot of criticism for for the same same reasons actually. So um, I'm pretty sure like you could probably I'd be highly surprised if you don't if, if if it's not already installed. Why you wouldn't be able to install Synaptic Manager? But I could sort of bumble around on this system um, for forever, and um, and 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 it probably wouldn't make a particularly good video. There's that little gra graphical glitch there. Um, truth be told though, um, this hasn't inspired me to try out GNOME 3. Um, but I like their bundled software, it's a safe pair of hands. Uh, I, I really do like their software manager. Uh, that's the best software manager I've seen hands down. There aren't that many great, I mean Synaptic's great if you know what you're looking for and if you are tech savvy. But if you are looking for a piece of software to do a specific job, and even not even, you know, Synaptic's fantastic at that. If there was some way that was actually, you know, human curated and human sorted lists of software, as you saw in, in that um, package manager there that was included with Fedora, um, it would make life a lot easier. It, you know, if you want a file manager, if you're not happy with the built-in file manager, if you're not happy with Nautilus, right, I want to see what my options are for file managers. Okay, click, utilities, file managers. Bang, it gives you a list of about six. That's all you need. That's plenty of choice with a little description, maybe some screenshots. Maybe it'll give you enough info to Google it and then find out what people's opinions were on that you know, side of things. Um, in short, this is very much the red hat side of Ubuntu to me. Um, and that's that's a compliment. Uh, it really is. If you're comfortable with um, sort of your, your RPM-based distributions, then... No doubt you've already tried Fedora, but yeah, Fedora is a safe pair of hands. Um, there are also plenty of um, distributions that, that use Fedora as a base, although admittedly they don't really come to the forefront very often. In fact, nowadays we do seem to be living in an age where Debian is the base for most operating systems. And again, like I say, Debian is my choice of base, but I also think that it's incredibly important to have uh, variety and, uh, and, and, and choice and options and competition. Um, yeah, too much of that can often be like in reinventing the wheel, but uh, but in this particular case, um, Fedora and Ubuntu, Red Hat and Debian, they are two separate families that uh, that are both exploring Linux in their own ways, and both of them have a lot to offer, and um, and and it's, it's you know it's, it's good to try out both. Um, so, like I say, best thing about Fedora here, definitely package management system. They improved that a lot since I was at university, and kudos to them for that. Uh, I was expecting to see GNOME 3 a little more mangled, a little more altered, changed, maybe some Fedora branding put on it or something. It does look like it's it's um, it's just the, the default looking GNOME 3. Nothing wrong with that. I was just expecting um, I was just expecting something a little more altered, but uh, but hey ho. Um, it's good, yeah. If you're looking for an RPM distro to try, this is your this is your this is your guy. So that's about it for me today. Thank you very very much for watching. If you guys have any suggestions on what distributions I should try out in the future, please let me know down in the comments section below. And um, until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.